From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, the Middle East Institute's podcast. I'm your host, Fadi Nicholas Nassar, and today we have the pleasure of hosting Emil Hkayim, Director of Regional Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. In today's episode, we'll unpack the evolving conflict between Hezbollah and Israel, exploring the nuances of the changing yet still uncertain rules of engagement. Our conversation will navigate the landscape of U.S.-led mediation efforts, examining both challenges and opportunities in preventing a full-scale war. Zooming in on Lebanon, we'll also delve into local outlooks on the potential for war and the impact of the ongoing presidential vacuum on mediation efforts and the implementation of U.N. Resolution 1701. We're very grateful to draw on Emil's valuable insights on regional security, local perspectives, U.S. foreign policy, and Lebanon's precarious future. Thank you for joining Middle East Focus. Grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy this insightful conversation with Emil Hkayim. Emil, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Fadi, for having me. Emil, I thought we could start off our discussion by diving into a sort of thorough breakdown of where we are currently in the ongoing and increasingly intensifying conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. In your opinion, are Lebanon and Israel sleepwalking into a full-scale conflict, or are we seeing shifting but still containable rules of engagement? Well, that's a complex question because it could be the latter, but if the parties fall into complacency or if there is a specific red line that's crossed that is not well understood by the other side, and you risk all that war. So at the moment, what we see on Israel's side is a willingness to risk a war while trying to degrade Hezbollah's capabilities. I think Israel is in mostly in attrition mode at the moment trying to take out specific capabilities, trying to essentially empty a zone in the south, creating, in a way, a de facto security zone in the south, and signaling to to Hezbollah that it can hit deeper in the territory, it can take out specific targets, depots, etc. And Israel has been the more risk-taking of the two. It has hit inside Beirut, although against a non-Lebanese target, Saleh al in, in early January, the, the Palestinian deputy leader of, of Hamas. It had hit outside Saida, it hit in Baalbek most recently. So Israel has hit deeper in Lebanese territory. And at the moment, it's over 200 Lebanese have died, approximately 40 plus civilians, including journalists and a couple of military personnel, LAF personnel. On the other side, you know, I think Hezbollah, which to be clear, is the one who initiated that round when it started firing rockets, although in small numbers on October 8th, so the day after the Hamas operation on October 7th. Hezbollah has, however, been sticking in a way by the old rules, whether it's because it is outgunned by Israel or out of careful calibration or in response to Iranian preferences. We can discuss that. But Hezbollah has largely stuck by the old rules, going after primarily military targets, not going deep into Israeli territory. And it's only at one stage, I think, since the beginning that we we can say that Hezbollah has done something qualitatively different when it used an advanced missile against a radar listening intelligence outpost in Israel and filmed defeat and released it. Uh, This was was an, an advanced capability that Hezbollah deployed. But I would argue that Hezbollah's behavior is shaped by a strategic concern, both among the Hezbollah leadership and in Tehran, that they want to avoid an all-out war. That, you know, the saving Hamas or or Gaza is not the priority there. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this is a great way for me to sort of follow up on that. If you could help our audience map out what do you think are the strategic calculations of, of both Israel and Hezbollah at this moment, towards the end of February? I think Israel wants to create a fait accompli on the ground. It wants to inflict enough 
physical damage on Hezbollah. It wants to push back or take out as many assets close to the border as possible. It wants to convey a psychological message to Hezbollah that, that Israel continues to have intelligence and air superiority, that they can go after specific targets, that they can monitor and so on. They want Hezbollah to feel uncomfortable. They want Hezbollah commanders to be worried about their safety and so on. From an Israeli perspective, a war against Hezbollah is a matter of time, essentially. What matters are the timing, the circumstances of that war, rather than whether that war will happen. One way to think about it is that the Israeli military thought it had dealt essentially with the Hamas problem, the way they describe it, right? That Hamas in Gaza had been beaten down and and contained and, and frozen. The Israeli military did not want, did not plan, did not prepare for a ground invasion in Gaza because they thought that that was a a thing of the past. Whereas since 2006, they've been planning and preparing for that large war in Lebanon. They always thought it was a matter of time, that in the meantime, yes, it's a matter of establishing deterrence and having agreed, if not written, (laughs) rules about, about escalation in this space, but that eventually this will happen, that this big war was more likely than not. From Hezbollah's perspective, the game is very different. It is about uh, maintaining the credibility of Hezbollah's deterrence, but by avoiding an all-out war. The way to think about Hezbollah is that uh, it is Iran's most formidable instrument of punishment and deterrence. I don't want to suggest that Hezbollah is a pure proxy of Iran. I think it's much more complicated and nuanced than that. But, you know, Hezbollah has become this this formidable organization that should be really used and deployed only when Iran's most existential interests are at stake. If ever Israel considers or does attack Iran on its own territory or goes after high-level figures, etc. So, in a way, you know, Hezbollah is too good, too powerful to be wasted on a indirect and possibly inconclusive conflict like the one, however horrific it is, uh, taking place in Gaza at the moment. One has to understand Iran's broader strategy. Iran wants to win in the region by harassing and exhausting the other side. Iran fights through a thousand small cuts. It does not want an all-out catastrophic confrontation because it would be at a disadvantage were it to go down this road. And so, you know, Iran has built this network of partners across the Middle East. So it has options to harass, to throw its rivals off balance so that it could, you know, threaten in the air or at sea or through guerrilla or terrorist means. And Hezbollah has a particular role in the setup. Uh, You know, Hezbollah is not going to behave the way your Iraqi militia would, or Hamas itself. No, thank you. I want to sort of, since you've highlighted that you want to speak a bit about Iran, first give you this moment to sort of expand on what you said. You said you don't want to define Hezbollah as merely a proxy of Iran. So how would you describe it? You've used the word partner, but could you sort of expand on that? And then I'll sort of get back to some interesting underlying elements on your earlier statement that I'd like to probe you on. But please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a very important issue. This is not purely an academic debate. When people describe Hezbollah or other groups as proxies, they make assumptions about command and control that are not necessarily proven by the evidence we have. Iran empowers, enables, consults, at times restrains some of these these players. It is certainly happy to work through them, to have political influence in the region, etc. But very often those players have a complex relation with, with, with Tehran. In the case of Hezbollah, I think it's better to think of Hezbollah as the trusted younger brother of Iran, like not as a mere instrument. I think Hezbollah is complex and sophisticated enough to make its own operational, political, and strategic assessments. 
However, the relationship is ideological, it is strategic, it is organic. And I think Hezbollah is the closest to Tehran of all Iran's partners out there. This is a serious relationship. They share the same worldview. They, they are in agreement. I think where it matters is on the decision to use force or not. I think Iran, Hezbollah does differ to Iran when it comes to big decisions of war and, of war and peace. So Hezbollah will listen to Iran when Iran tells it, this is not the moment to fight the big one against Israel, and or be restrained in your use of specific weaponry, for instance. At the same time, I think if Iran does perceive an existential threat, Hezbollah will be very quick to stand by Iran's side. But this is more of a relation of trust over four plus decades than one of subservience and full dependence on Iran. What's very interesting is earlier on you described a context in which Hezbollah's sort of role in Iran's strategic thinking is a key deterrence against an existential threat to Iran. But let me ask if the flip side holds. If Hezbollah faces an existential threat, would that sort of necessitate Iranian military action? That's the hardest question, and uh, it's good you're, you're asking it. Iran would have options. I mean, but I think the first determination in Iran would be, is Israel going after Hezbollah because it wants to go after Iran next? Is Israel defending Hezbollah or trying to defend Hezbollah because it has a broader agenda? And if so, it would make sense for Iran to come to the rescue of Hezbollah. Now, that said, I think, you know, there is an escalation ladder there. You know, the Iranians and Hezbollah have spent years building up Hezbollah's strategic arsenal. Iran can call upon non-Iranian fighters, if need be, to, to supplement Hezbollah's troops if it turns into a large-scale ground war. Iran can send technology. It can send advisors and commanders. It doesn't need to be fully engaged in this space. It, Iran may consider that better to go for a war of attrition on the eastern Mediterranean, try to bleed Israel, the, Israel's military there, in a long war where you know, you're know you throwing lots of bodies, the array of militias that we saw Iran organize and deploy in, in Syria in the previous decades, rather than take on a direct role. However, if the determination in Iran is that this is the opening gambit for a much larger conflict, then they may well be a decision in Tehran that all fronts should be open. Knowing Iran's risk aversion, I suspect that they will explore all other options before plunging directly into that conflict. Thank you. Earlier on, you shared with us you know, a very interesting framework. You said Israel's calculations have shifted from when conflict will come rather than if conflict will come with Hezbollah. And yet, Hezbollah's calculations seem to be sort of aimed at perhaps countering this by leveling and raising its credible deterrence. So maybe I'm going to ask you the impossible question. How does that for you sort of shape the likelihood of a full-scale conflict? Yes, there is a mismatch there. Israel, a more risk-taking Israel, and a more restrained Hezbollah in this specific moment. The way to look at it is to say, if in Israeli thinking, a war is likely or inevitable, is that the right moment? Israeli society is still traumatized. The Israeli leadership wants to demonstrate that after the debacle of October 7, that they can keep their eye on a gathering threat you know, this is still a moment of, in a way, uh, where, where Israel has some sympathy globally. I mean, rapidly shrinking, I would argue, but Israel can still make the strategic argument. And the population itself is on board. The war in Lebanon would look really, would be very different from the war in Gaza. One should expect a higher level of casualties on both sides, both military and civilian. It would be much bigger than Gaza, although perhaps not in strict humanitarian terms, because, you know, Lebanon would not be... Essentially, Gaza is a box that the Israelis can almost do whatever they want in. And we see the 
humanitarian devastation that the Israeli campaign is causing, Lebanon would be a bit different. But I think that from an Israeli perspective, essentially, you look at the northern front and you say, well, perhaps Hezbollah could do what Hamas did times 10 because it's a bigger battle, a hardened force. I'm not saying that Hezbollah wants to do it or would do it. I'm just describing what I think is the Israeli perspective there. From Hezbollah's perspective, the view is different. The view of time is different. I don't think that Hezbollah is interested in going deep into or saying that it can go deep in Israeli territory. It is really about, in a way, the balance of terror there. It's about telling Israel we can hit deep, we can go after population centers, about critical infrastructure against military targets, including mobilization sites, etc., in case of a conflict. So, you know, we can inflict significant pain. I mean, much greater than whatever Hamas says. So let's not go this way. Let's stick by the old rules. Israel will look at that and say, well, perhaps we can change those rules. And I think this is probably where we're heading. I tend to be on the pessimistic side. I think the chances of war are significant. And I would say, if it's a deliberate decision, I still think that it's more likely that Israel would do it over Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, against this very volatile context, that an uncertain context that you're describing for us, what are the chances of U.S.-led diplomatic efforts and mediation efforts in preventing a full-scale war? Is there still an opportunity for diplomacy that you see? Well, we can criticize U.S. policy quite a lot, and I think it's certainly warranted given the catastrophe in Gaza. But when it comes to the region, I think the U.S. Uh, top priority has been to avoid the regionalization of that war. And I would argue that they had some success early on. I think we, we came very close to a large conflict between Hezbollah and Israel in the early days of that war in, in October. And the U.S. played a critical role in restraining Israel. I think since then, things have been more complicated, in part because the escalation or escalation in the region really depends on what's happening in Gaza. Without a ceasefire in Gaza, it's difficult to see the Northern Front or the Red Sea stabilize. But in contrast, even if you have a ceasefire in Gaza, that doesn't guarantee uh, the escalation on the Northern Front or in the Red Sea. It's possible that the Hussis will continue their operations regardless of what happens in Gaza. And it's very possible that, you know, as the Israeli defense minister said a couple of days ago, that the Israelis will, if there is a ceasefire in Gaza, will then focus their attention and assets towards the north. So I think the prospect of conflict remains quite high. And the Americans are trying. I mean, you know, the one person whose efforts we're all looking at is Amos Hochstein, a special presidential envoy of Joe Biden. He has, I can claim, a success. He's the person who has negotiated the 2022 maritime deal between Lebanon and, and Israel, which a lot of us, including myself, thought was highly unlikely. Well, he did it. So perhaps he will be able to pull off something, although the circumstances are considerably different. Back then, Hezbollah wanted to de-escalate. The region wasn't on fire. Lebanon needed good news. And so there was a window of opportunity, whereas this time things are significantly different. The question is really the sequencing of the American approach. Uh, they seem to be wanting to free things as they are, then agree that anything that was added to southern Lebanon since October 7, 8 is withdrawn. But there's no essentially, you know, no reconstruction in the south immediately and so on as tensions go down. And then they, I suspect, would like to get into a negotiation over the border itself and then discuss broader issues, support for the Lebanese armed forces, perhaps uh, increasing numbers in UNIFIL, talk more about the implementation of 1701 and so on. But that's a tall order from going, starting very small and then going very big in a country that is still very dysfunctional at so many levels. So the question from a Lebanese side is, can the system or whatever is left in the country, can it handle it? Because that would be 
quite a lot for a country that has only enacting government, prime minister, and no president, and where legitimacy is very contested. I'm not even discussing, you know, where Hezbollah is, fits in, in, in all of that. I want to, you know, I do appreciate you sharing with our audience the broad sort of framework of the mediation that is taking place. I wanted to ask, where does UN Resolution 1701 fit in all of this? Well, 1701, which was adopted in 2006 and technically ended that specific war, is international law. This is what Lebanon and Israel are committed to implement. But we know that Israel regularly violates 1701, and certainly Lebanon does not apply it, and Hezbollah clearly flouts it. You know, there's plenty of evidence of weaponry coming through Syria before and since the Syrian war. There are large deployments in the south, etc., etc. In current circumstances, thinking about a new resolution seems impossible getting the various parties to to go for the Security Council. And, and given the competition at the global level, whether one wants to open that kind of forms seems it's just an impossibility. So 1701 is essentially the best we have. But for it to be viable, first, you would need a functioning state. You would need a, a well-resourced LAF. You would need a level of a higher level of consensus inside Lebanon. And you would need Israel to stand down no longer pursuing intrusive air and other types of penetration of the country. And again, that's disregarding Hezbollah and so on. So my point is, we're never going to implement, at least in the foreseeable future, you know, the next couple of years, 1701 fully. The question is, how do you, in a way, crowd the space so that it becomes impossible for any party to take the risk of an all-out war? When I say this, is like, do you send more troops? Do you make it more physically, operationally difficult to operate for both the Israelis and Hezbollah? Do you incentivize the Lebanese by offering them economic incentives, trying to put the country back on track, trying to figure out, you know, a, a solution for the presidency and then, you know, have more or hopefully better governance than we've had in the past few years when the country has seems really adrift? with no public policy initiatives being taken, essentially. That's going to be the big challenge. Can third parties play a role here in sort of bolstering the credibility, as you put it, or offering security guarantees of the respect of any sort of agreement, whether 1701 or, if, as you mentioned, if there is some sort of future negotiation? But do third parties play a role amidst this context of heightened mistrust? Third parties are an essential part of the game. Security guarantees, well, Israel has a de facto security guarantees with the U.S. Lebanon does not have security guarantees, but which Lebanon would we sign up to that? Which country would provide that to Lebanon? You can argue that the presence of international forces as part of UNIFIL is a kind of security guarantee. But at the same time, if you are a contributing nation to UNIFIL, you're really worried about being entangled in the conflict. Uh, I doubt the Spaniards or the Chinese or the Fijian or the French want to lose soldiers in a war on which they will have very little control. So I think the security guarantees is, is too much to ask for at the moment. But mediation is essentially the name of the game, or it has been for the 2022 maritime border delineation. 2006, by the way, was another case of that. I mean, we, we may not like those episodes, I'm just being descriptive, but, you know, even 2008, when Hezbollah took over Beirut, uh, it was the Qataris and, and others who jumped into this mess to try to calm things down. There will not be a direct bilateral Lebanese-Israeli negotiation anytime soon, and certainly not while Palestine is on fire and bleeding. I think that we should have lower expectations about what can be done and how it can be done. The big question for me is, will the U.S. have much credibility left after this current round of violence that it can put together a group of like-minded countries to make tangible offers to both Israel and Lebanon? That may be a question of time. You know, Perhaps the Biden administration understands that this needs to be done, but who knows what the Trump administration 
you know, Trump were to be elected again in 2024 would sink. I mean, he had always little interest in, in the space. His goal was always normalization uh, with faraway states rather than figuring out a fair and sustainable agreement immediately around and with Israel. The clock is, in a way, against that. But what can I say? You know, I want to a bit sort of redirect the question and building off of, of what you've just shared by going a bit back to 2006. The main Lebanese partner when it came to UN Resolution 1701 was the Lebanese state. Today, Lebanon is led by a caretaker government, has not had a president for more than a year. You've mentioned the role of the Lebanese army and UNIFIL, both arguably have manifestly failed to ensure border security. Now, considering the ongoing presidential vacuum in Lebanon, how does the absence of the state and effective leadership impact the mediation efforts you've outlined for us and the implementation of UN Resolution 1701? So certainly the, the weakening, I'm not going to say demise just yet, but the weakening of the Lebanese state is, is a fundamental factor there. Without a, a legitimate president and, and, and government, it's very difficult to see how the Lebanese state can you know, reach an agreement, implement it, be seen as credible. And you know, a lot of those processes that I discussed earlier, delineation of the border or sending more troops and so on, they could start without a president, but they won't go that far. You will need a legitimate authority that can take negotiations and, and progress and so on to, to the next stage. In 2006, Lebanon still had goodwill. The 2005 uprising was fresh on everyone's mind. The French president was very engaged. The Bush administration, yes, was a bit deluded early on, thinking that the 2006 war was, Condi Rice called it, the burst bang of the new Middle East and, and so on. But this is no longer the case today. You know, you can argue back in 2005, 2006, Lebanon was priority number two three or four in the Middle East. Now it's probably priority number 17 or, or 36, as far as I know. There's less goodwill, the vacuum, the economic crisis, the port explosion, all made Lebanon look like a, you know, a totally dysfunctional place. So internationally, there is less sympathy. Regionally, the Gulf states and others who you know, had been uh, quite involved are considerably less interested. They feel that Lebanon is a place where you waste time and money and take a reputational hits. So Lebanon is starting from a much lower base this time, even as the stakes are considerably more serious than they were in 2006. And as much as Lebanese like to complain about how international or regional power plays uh, affect and influence their politics, in reality, it's, it's entirely a Lebanese, not entirely, it's primarily a Lebanese dysfunction. And country after country has made it clear that the Lebanese needed to get their act together. And we don't see that. Delegation of Lebanese politicians visit foreign capitals to complain about Hezbollah or this, or these people have not been able to pass a single law reforming the economic governance, even as the country is bleeding. So they don't sound very credible. And that's a big, what's happening right now is a big test of credibility. You know, I want to sort of push a bit here. How much of that is, you know, you, you've sort of highlighted that the failure of Lebanese actors to respond to the multifaceted compounded crises since 2019, where Lebanon has seen an economic meltdown, the erosion of its you know, currency past any reasonable point. I mean, the vast majority of its population is living in multidimensional poverty. And sort of that is a testament of the direction Lebanon is heading towards state failure, that it's lost that credibility. What I do want to press here is, without excusing, right, this sort of mafia-esque political class, should we equivocate between them and Hezbollah? Or is there something else that explains this relationship? Because I do think it's important to clarify, right? Because you've earlier on told us that when it comes to existential issues of war and peace, Hezbollah defers to Iran. 
And right now in this pressing moment, existential decisions of whether Lebanon should enter a conflict with Israel is not determined by caretaker Prime Minister Miati. It's determined by that dynamic you've described with Hezbollah and Iran. Where I'm getting to all of this is how has international responses since 2008 affected Lebanese stakeholders? In a sense, is this the government they also have enabled to become what it is? You know, and for our audience not too familiar, we've seen since 2008, since that takeover of Beirut, systematic efforts of coercion, political violence, again, without excusing corruption and other aspects that are deserve their special attention. But my worry here is that we will come off equivocating. No, certainly. I want to be clear that however incompetent or corrupt other Lebanese actors are, they have no power. They're not the ones who risk taking the country in all at war. It is really Hezbollah that poses essentially the biggest threat to the Lebanese state today. It is Hezbollah members who have been found guilty for the assassination of a former prime minister. It's Hezbollah that in 2006 has taken the very risky act that led to the war. It's Hezbollah that took over Beirut in 2008. It's Hezbollah that went into Syria and contributed to a cataclysmic war there that has had a multifaceted impact on Lebanese society, politics, economics, and, and so on. So I don't want for a second to suggest that I see Hezbollah as, as or possibly even less malign than other Lebanese actors. My point is that even when the regional tensions were, when they were much lower, the Lebanese system could not produce ideas, could not produce public policy. The banking and financial and economic crisis are very much a product of everyone in the country. I mean, everyone has benefited, everyone has perhaps not in the same magnitude and, and, and so on. But my point is that the Lebanese system has a way of essentially corrupting everyone, including the best intention and the cleanest people. Now, I agree, at the moment now, it is entirely a Hezbollah decision whether to take the country towards the Abyss or not. And more so, I would argue, it's Israel's decision, because as I argued from the beginning, Israel seems much more risk-taking at this specific moment. Much of it will depend on the kind of pressure that is and diplomacy that are applied with Iran. After the cycle, which you know is taking or the whole region close to the edge, will there be a different way of engaging Iran? And when I say engagement, I don't mean it as doing Iran's bidding or accepting its dicta to the country, like pressuring Iran to rethink its regional strategy. But much of it will also depend on what Israel is willing to put on the table, including a, a Palestinian state. So I agree that all these questions are much, much bigger than Lebanon per se, or the capacity of the Lebanese entity to deal with. So, I mean, we're at the beginning of a very long and difficult process. And that process may not start altogether, to be honest. You've painted a very bleak picture, and I, and I want us to sort of, you know, unpack it a bit. You've described Israel's decision-making as largely considering some form of conflict as inevitable, that there is no partner, viable partner in Lebanon that there is very limited and low goodwill among international partners, whether in the region, in the United States, in Europe, towards Lebanon rising either out of intention or capacity to the multifaceted challenges that it faces. Is this a moment for a reset in policy towards Lebanon, whether local policy you know, that comes from bottom up or international policy towards the country? Or do you just not see that happening? Do you see just a very dangerous, dark future ahead. I'm pessimistic. I'm not fatalistic. I don't want to suggest that there is no agency, that nothing can be done, etc. I, I, I'm a sunnier person than my uh, analysis suggests right now. The point here is that the fundamental reset has to happen on the Lebanese side. The Lebanese got used, if not hooked, on international and regional attention. We expected the international community, the Gulf states, others to 
care about our politics, to put in money when needed, to mobilize diplomatically in times of crisis and so on. This moment has passed. We have to adjust to a lower level of attention, a, a lower desire to put in assets and, and, and so on. In a way, we had our couple of decades in the sun, and they landed us in a pretty dire political, and economic, and, and security more asset. Is there a bottom-up approach? Yes. I mean, you know, like others, you know, I see the talent and uh, and the reformist ideas and personalities in the country trying to do things. They should certainly be encouraged. If only they had won uh, more seats at the 2018 election, and if only they had remained a bit more cohesive, although there was no expectation from the beginning. But this is a group that once it faced the hard realities, did splinter. From an international perspective, I think that there are countries that will always be interested in Lebanon. France is one of them. You know, there's a couple countries in the Gulf who still have a soft spot for us. And, but fundamentally, they don't want to be taken for granted. Taken for granted. They don't think that they can come up with a formula that stabilizes things on their own. They want to see more effort, more compromises among the Lebanese. And they want to see a bit more domestically generated accountability as well. The debacle over the port of Beirut is one of the explosion there, is one example. I mean, can someone tell us exactly if there is a judicial process or how far and let's take, well, or over the collapse of the banking sector? It's just that from an external perspective, it feels like even on issues that where Hezbollah is not fundamentally involved or, or could be quite peripheral, there's no sense of movement. And that, you know, leads external countries to wonder, you know, should they get involved? Is there any good that can come from a more activist, more voluntarist policy towards a country? But, you know, even if we look at the Port of Beirut blast, I think if that experience has demonstrated anything, it's that local investigations cannot surpass the very real roadblock of political violence. And the obstruction that was witnessed for Judge Bitar and the absence of international support, meaningful support for local calls for an international inquiry, perhaps paint a different story that Lebanon is already too low, that while I do share your call for greater accountability, it's not just the Lebanese who are falling short, and we need to maybe unpack who we refer to when we speak of Lebanese of prioritizing accountability. It's also international partners. I mean, certainly, I get the point. But the issue is not just the lack of legal accountability and so on. It's also Lebanese society mobilizes at times. And then when accountability doesn't come through, seems to demobilize, right? Everyone was taken by, or almost everyone was taken by the port investigation. And then once we hit the roadblock, once the politicians and others intimidate a judge and get away with it and so on, in a way, you know, there is a cynicism in Lebanon. That's what it is. Let's move on. You know, one of the candidates for the Lebanese presidency, uh, Slaimane Frangie, is essentially the political patron of some of the highest level suspects, right, in the investigation. And yet he is entertained as a viable candidate even though he publicly, you know, went out and defended them. And yet, you know, you will still have people inside the country who, you know, are willing to overlook it. Although I would, it's not clear what his own chances. I mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it was the French initiative, right, that put an added legitimacy to Frenchy, despite local opposition. I totally agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And I think this is, the, the French initiative is, a good example of international efforts going wrong. I think the problem is wanting a solution at any cost may lead you to make those unconscionable trade-offs. The French thinking was, let's put together a president, even if we don't like, with a prime minister that we like. It was more of a package kind of thinking. And, and by the way, the French were not alone in it. And I, I still think that in some quarters, that's an idea that, that is floated around. Some foreign officials 
will tell you, oh, the presidency is not that important. Or, okay, Frangie may, may not be liked by lots of people in the country, but at the, at the same time, he's a local political baron. He's not a very influential leader. So he won't be a Michel Aoun, essentially, trying to, to stuff the bureaucracy and the military and the judiciary and so on with his cronies because he, he doesn't have that many people. So let's not make a big deal out of it. Whereas the reformist argument is to say, look, guys, if you want to create a new momentum in the country, if you want to set a new agenda and so on, it has to start from the top. And starting that process with major compromises like this one will kill the whole reformist project from the very beginning. So, I mean, I, I take the point. And I think that's the danger, which is how do you reconcile some of our idealistic hopes with the pressure of getting a deal because, well, the country is going down or because war is around the corner. I mean, these are my you know, extreme assessments, but you know, for the sake of describing you know, the kind of urgency that drives some of these international approaches. Emil, thank you. I, I don't want to take too much of your time, and I have only two quick questions that you know, I hope won't take more than two minutes each. Just because you know, you've really described to us uh, you know, you've brought so many important themes, and I, and I found very, you know, what was underlying and quite moving in what you were saying is, you know, Lebanon went from being on the precipice of such hope in 2019, uh, and for multiple different reasons that we can all talk about, to this point of despair. You know, and you'll allow me for just asking an open question. The next few years, I know you've described yourself as skeptical, despite, you know, the significance of reform, reform for the economy, reform for the state, all the things you've outlined. Do you see that materializing despite its urgency? Or are those factors uh, just too crippling? I think one should have realistic expectations in the short to medium term. The key now is to stabilize things and avoid what is still a possible cataclysmic scenario. I'm worried of overloading whomever, you know, has the responsibility of guiding the country in, in the next stage with with extremely high expectations. This is not Lebanon 1991, 1992. Yes, there was ongoing Syrian occupation, uh, Hezbollah was growing and so on, but Lebanon had good will, had good press, had supporters globally and, and, and so on. Yes, it didn't end up well, but that's in large part because of the, of the Lebanese. We we shouldn't be we should be primarily thinking about our internal governance and about the shape of our future economy. Essentially, a lot of the assumptions that drove our development in the since the nineties were proven wrong. You know, the centrality of the banking sector uh, system, the assumption that foreign donors will always be present and, and generous. The idea that trade with Syria will enrich us, etc., and, and it came at the cost of our industry, our labor force, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think you know what's needed now is to have those hard but honest debates about what we want the the country to to look at. We also have to be very clear about the kind of outcome regionally that makes sense for the country. I don't expect a, a full resolution to, you know, these dramatic conflicts around us. But what is the Lebanese ask of the international community in terms of Palestinian refugees, Syrian refugees, how their needs are met, whether they are social services to provide, uh, but, you know, how to match, uh, how to make sure that the Lebanese people get as much, if not more, at times, but also try to diffuse the strong tensions and passions within society. This is a society that is extremely tired, that is on edge, and hopefully there will be some space for that. 2019, in a way, was exhilarating in the sense that it was a, a genuine popular movement that wasn't directed from the top and wasn't hijacked by political interests. It was essentially repressed by, by the state, it was hijacked by COVID, by, by the port explosion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's important to keep in mind that there is agency and being honest about what needs to be discussed and doing it is quite important. And I realize here that earlier I made a mistake when I talked about 2018 elections, I meant the 2022 elections. Right. 
No, thank you, Emil. I want to end our conversation again with perhaps an impossible question. You know, we started talking about conflict and as it looms large over Lebanon, it is the key question. And I think it's on many, many minds right now and those who are listening. How do you see the next few months? For you, is a conflict inevitable? Is it coming in the next few months or is this just too difficult to answer? I don't think conflict is inevitable. I do, however, think it's it's more likely than not. So it's I think the chances are above 50%. And I'm quite concerned about Israeli risk-taking that we see vis-a-vis, vis-a-vis Hezbollah. I'm obviously quite concerned about the unnecessary loss of civilian life, you know, houses, uh, infrastructure. I mean, you know, this is uh, in a way... but. From a more strategic standpoint, I worry that we will adjust and normalize to this medium level of violence, uh, this medium intensity that we see, and then continue, right? I mean, this is a new normal. This should not be the new normal. The country cannot have the hard discussions I just laid out, cannot think about political leadership, about economic reform, etc., while the country is being exposed to bombs and to, you know, that kind of pressure. And to be honest, a lot will depend on what happens elsewhere in the region. Things in Gaza are far from settled. The Israeli campaign can cause a lot more devastation there. The West Bank is really unsettled. Things can go wrong in the Red Sea in a minute. And then there's all the groups that are aligned with Iran that can decide to just turn the heat up. To just do something as brutal as October 7th for this matter. There are other there are escalation scenarios, you know, further away from Lebanon can have a, a direct impact on, on Lebanese stability. I mean, cautionary words, Emil, important words. I appreciate your advice, your insight. Do you have any closing words you want to share for our audience? Perhaps it's the nature of, of, of our business, uh, conflict and political analysts, to be pessimistic. I know, however, there are a lot of people uh, trying their best to produce good outcomes, do excellent work and so on. So it's important to listen to all these people as well. So don't leave this podcast feeling uh, totally gloomy. They are certainly good things to highlight. Thank you, Emil, and thank you for being one of those voices of insight. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. That's us for Middle East Focus. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute, To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.